we can start now, I'm sorry. We normally start at seven, so I'm not that much later than I should have been. Um, we had some tech issues, so I have to stand here because we're filming this. Um, we always film it so it can go on YouTube for people who couldn't make it. And I can't reach the thing. <laughs> and we had a clicker, but we can't find it. So it's all gonna be fine though. There's only like five slides, so uh, we'll manage. Um, there's a lot of you here, that's great. Thank you for coming. Um, so I'll just, uh, there's like hashtags and things you can use if you want. We have a website now so you can find the podcast we do and some other stuff that we're up to. See, that went fine. It wasn't that big a deal. We need to waste five minutes running around getting mouses. So this is what we're going to do today. So this is our seventh event. Um, I recognise most of your faces, so I think you know how this works by now. But for those who haven't been before, uh, we have a funders panel. So these are people that fund tech for good projects. Um, and we've also, so we've got Billy Dan from Comic Relief, Ed Cox from Reason Digital. He uh, isn't a funder, but has received funding for Tech for Good. Uh, Kieran from Cast and Jessica from Bethnal Green Ventures. Then we're going to do, so that's going to be kind of q and I'll lead it with some questions I've prepared in case none of you have any ideas. Um, but then, yeah, uh, questions from the audience. We'll try and keep it like, um, as, as like, usually I will have a microphone and that makes it easy because I can hand the microphone to the person asking the question kind of like uh, regulates the whole thing but we don't have a microphone today so we will do like hands and I'll, I'll pick people and we are filming it so we're gonna make sure that you, we, you can be picked up on the microphone as well uh, then we've got lightning talks so uh, some people I think already want to do lightning talks have a think if you want to do one uh, so that'll be a quick minute or two stood at the front talking about whatever you want tech, tech for good related ideally um and then we can hang around for a little bit longer and i think there's some pizza and plenty of beer left so you'll have a chat afterwards and that's it really um sponsors reason digital thank you very much for reason digital hyper island as well for the space it's a really nice cool space here um and we've got tech suit and 34 sp so 34 sp funded all the booze and uh Pizza, so yeah, they always get the biggest cheer. <laughs> Sometimes I think some of you just come for the pizza. Um, so, uh, without further ado, if I can invite the funders up to your boy band seating. <laughs> well, the order I have, you may as well set in order. Billy, Dan, don't know what, which, which way we want to go. Ed, Kieran, Jessica. Oh, that way around. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> this is really weird. Yeah. Uh, so I just wondered if you wouldn't mind doing like intros to yourselves one by one, so like a quick three minutes or something, just so everybody knows who you are. Uh, do you want to start here? Hi, my name's Billy Dan. I work at Comic Relief. Um, I'm our, my official title is Grants Digital Innovation Manager, and I oversee our Tech for Good work uh, UK and internationally. Um, we have always funded uh, tech stuff that's just come through our UK main program and through our international program. Most of our international work is sub-Saharan Africa. Um, but over the last couple of years, we've tried to be a bit more, we're trying to be a bit more, uh, have a bit more strategy to it. So we've got a UK Tech for Good program. We've had one in the past. We've had, just finished one. We're selecting the projects to fund and we sit that firmly within the idea of digital innovation and transformation of services to beneficiaries. Uh, we can only fund um, not-for-profits uh, and social enterprises where that some of you guys some of you guys will fit that description but some of you will also be working in partnership with charities and that's absolutely we think vital that that we encourage the relationship where charities work with digital partners and you know, digital partners do the development work and that's what a lot of our money is spent on. Um, we see that, and we develop on our international stuff at the moment, and we're, uh, International Tech for Good, we've just commissioned a piece of research on social tech ecosystems in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, we saw, we, at the moment, you know, we're discovering as we go along, we've just uh, developed a new application process of video only, and we are hoping to publish the best videos um, shortly to inspire people and encourage people to form partnerships. Uh, we see what we're trying to do is see tech and digital, not just us funding it, but actually as a, a more open process in terms of people applying and discovering what each other is doing and working together more. Um, so yeah, that's uh, really where we are. We believe in probably at the moment we're erring on the side of small 
I say small amounts of money, I say 40, 50 grand over a small certain period to encourage uh, an innovation to happen. Uh, alongside providing money, we also provide support through technical expertise. We buy into support projects. Rather, that there are some three-year revenue projects, but that's quite old-style charity funding that we're trying to gear, gear away from for tech stuff. Um, I'm Ed Cox. I, I set up Reason Digital eight years ago. Uh, so we we started as um, a, a digital agency that, that makes websites and mobile apps for charities and for social causes. Uh, so we don't make e-commerce websites. Uh, we don't sell kitchens, double glazing, that sort of thing. Uh, so we started purely by um, working on projects for charities. Um, but as time has gone on, we've got more into the into the tech for good kind of space, uh, working more in partnership with with charities, with social enterprises, with other businesses as well. Uh, so I guess our ambition is that, that to become a tech partner of choice uh, for people who have great ideas. Um, who make social change happen regardless of what sector that's in. Um, so we're a recipient of uh, funding from organisations like Comic Relief, uh, from the Nominet Trust. Uh, we've been involved in projects um, that, that have had funding from Bethnal Green Ventures as well. Um, and <clears throat> we also try and work, we, we have a, a kind of internal innovation programme uh, where we, we try and come up with, with our own ideas as well as working with other people. Um, and I like to describe ourselves as a, a human-centred, design-led uh, organisation where we prefer to work with the, the beneficiaries of, of social tech because we believe that the best people suited to, to sort their own problems out are the people who, who encounter those issues. Um, so we, we try and fight the whole thing of the, the arrogance of tech, where, where you get techies going in and say, this is how you sort your problem. Uh, we'll do this and we'll sort this out. So we try and work with people to, to test assumptions, um, to, to do focus groups, to do user testing, to co-design and co-build things with people uh, that are encountering, encountering social issues. Um, and funders like Comic Relief, Bethel Green Ventures, they, they, they help us um, test ideas, build prototypes, um, perhaps do something riskier than, than, than we may fund ourselves to do or that we might not have the opportunity to do ourselves. Um, some of the projects that, that we've done in the past, if, if you've ever been to any of events that we've spoken at before, uh, we, we built uh, an app to help keep sex workers safer um, so that they can send alerts to each other um, about imminent dangers. Uh, we're working with the University of Manchester on an app to help uh, older people prevent trips and falls so that they can become uh, physically more active, uh, reduce isolation and mental health issues. Uh, we're working on projects with uh, Childline, with Age UK, all, all kinds of people of all kinds of demographics. Um, and it means that the staff uh, that, that work with us get to encounter many different kinds of people uh, from, from lots of different kind of backgrounds every single day and uh, yeah that, that's one of the things I enjoy most, most about, about what we do. Um, so I'm here on the panel tonight to talk about being a recipient of, 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 of grants from the other people that are here. Um, hey, how you doing? Um, my name is Kieran. I've um, got a couple of perspectives, hopefully they're useful today. So firstly, um, I'm one of the directors of an organisation called CAST. Um, CAST uh, basically we're kind of set up because there's loads of awesome stuff happening like on a small scale that's really good yay uh, and then there's some stuff that's happening on a big scale that's also nice and um, sadly in the middle there's a kind of desolate wasteland uh, where people fall off a cliff so that's kind of a way it was set up one of the things that we do that we're most known for is uh, running a kind of accelerator program for charities called Fuse uh, which is funded by Common Relief yay thanks um, <laughs> um, which basically is a really intensive three month process because our rationale is if you want to get tech good to scale it's useful to think about working with organisations who can already achieve that scale. And charities are a massive part of that system. So we take the charity team out, um, like a couple of people from the charity team, work with them for three months, wrap like design, developer, UX, around them for three months to develop a new digital product and service. And then the last month, we put them back into the charity uh, where they can take their training, their learning, the digital product, and sort of integrate it back into the charity. <coughs> so that's really good. We've got seven, seven charities this year, ranging from like really big ones like Oxfam, through to Women's Aid or Claw Social Leadership. So 
so really cool that's good that's the thing second thing is um, I used to work for Nominate Trust I was part of the team who sort of grew Nominate Trust over a few years which is quite a big tech for good funder in the UK so we just sort of designed and developed and delivered their programs for a number of years so um, hopefully that gives a couple of perspectives um, I've got five things that I'm going to tell you about funders they're quite candid one Funding's a market, right? People are supporting projects that fit their, how they see they want the world to change. So every funder has some theory of change about how they see the world changing, and they support projects who align with that. That's an important thing to be aware of. So don't think just because you've got an awesome project, someone will fund it. You've got to find the right person, fit the right funder to fit your, your theory. Secondly, it's a confidence game. Um, there are so many people with so many good ideas applying for funding. If you're not confident and articulate about what you're doing, and the people don't have confidence in you, it won't get any support. Thirdly, uh, it's it's funding. <laughs> funding is personal, right? Like you, building relationships up in funding is really important, not because it, of any sort of nepotism, but because people have so many applications. Like understanding the human element of this is really important. And funders, if you get funding support, having a good relationship with your funder, they'll be your best advocates. So it's really important to don't see funders as money, see them as people, because that's what they are. Which is my third point, which is that funders are people too. Every one of these people has an incredible amount of experience. You know, I ran like a multi-million pound ed tech company before I started with a nominate trust, and no one ever asked me about that. Well, I was a nominate trust because people just saw you as a money, which is a shame because like I think people missed out on some things there. Um, and the lastly is don't don't waste your time or theirs. If there's a funding program and you don't think you're aligned to it, don't waste anyone's time by going for it. You'll waste your own time and you'll waste theirs because funding is so competitive. You have to be really sure there's an alignment between what you're looking for and what the what the, where, where the funder is at. Those are five points. Thanks. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, I had to follow Karen, and Karen's always very energetic, so I'll try <laughs> and be lively. Um, so, hi, I'm Jess. I am a partner from Bethnal Green Ventures. Um, thank you for having me here today. Um, so, Bethnal Green Ventures is an accelerator program for tech for good, for profit ventures. Um, can you do me a hand and uh, favour and just sort of raise your hand if you know what an accelerator is? Most people in the room. But um, so, uh, an accelerator program or kind of incubators with funding. Uh, you might have sort of heard different terms bandied about. Um, it essentially, from my perspective anyway, uh, is a type of uh, support for um, normally relatively early stage ideas that combines funding um, alongside kind of an intensive program um, of learning, uh, which might consist of um, kind of workshops, talks, that kind of thing, and also um, with networks and connections to, to mentors. Um, if you look up accelerators in London or go on to kind of things like F Success, you'll see that there is now like a bunch of accelerator programs all over the UK. Um, some of them in the kind of more social tech for good space, others not. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about like what we do and then you'll get maybe get a bit of a feel for like what it's like um, to be on an accelerator program and what we look for. Uh, so essentially we, our 12 week accelerator program runs twice a year um, and it's a competitive application process to get on. Um, we're actually open for applications at the moment, um, so have a look at our, our website later um, if, if this ends up sounding interesting to you. Um, but uh, we ask for ventures to apply online through our kind of online application form um, and from that we then interview a bunch of ventures um, and end up selecting ten, around about 10 teams um, that we then invite to come onto the programme. Um, in terms of what we're looking for and, and who we work with, um, they all have to be ventures that have an idea for using technology to tackle a particular social or environmental problem and we work across kind of I guess we're now talking about five different themes. So one is healthcare, um, education, sustainability, things around like um, waste, resource efficiency, renewable energy. Um, we're really interested in things around democracy, um, civic engagement, particularly with everything that's been going on lately. Um, I think we need a lot of tech for good in that area at the moment. Um, and we've just launched a new partnership actually um, with an organisation called the Resolution Trust to try and find tech for good ideas that are going to support low wage workers, um, which is also a really interesting area. Um, we're calling it Worker Tech. Again, there's more info of that on that on our website if you want to find out more. Um, so teams that fall within that category 
um, apply, it tends to be a team rather than an individual, um, and that's because we found that teams benefit from the program more. It's really intensive, and sole founders um, sometimes sort of struggle along the way. Um, we tend to prefer there to be a technical person within the team, um, so that obviously they can do the kind of prototyping and building themselves and be really um, adaptive and, and flexible to change. Um, in terms of how far along they have to be, we, we had taken quite early stage ideas. Um, you don't necessarily have to have a prototype in place, but you have to have a really clear understanding of the social problem that you're solving. Um, obviously have a solution to it, but we know that that solution is going to change. Um, and what we're really looking for is essentially, it's the quality of the team, the understanding of the problem, and um, some evidence of kind of user-centered thinking. So um, what you were saying before, we think that kind of user-centered approach is really important. So you've gone out, you've spoken with the people that are gonna be using the product or service, and you've got some real insights to back up your own assumptions. So. We've got our 10 teams that kind of fit that category. Um, they will come onto the program um, and every team gets investment. Um, and so our offer is uh, £20,000 uh, investment and we do that, um, uh, we take a stake in their company for that money, so we take a 6% stake. Um, uh, and then we have a co-working space in London, um, so we expect the teams to be working on this as full time if possible. They come into the space, um, we have a, a program of workshops and talks, We've got a network of about 100 mentors that we've, we've built up over the past four years from all sorts of different um, backgrounds. Um, we connect the teams to investors, we connect them to sort of our networks within different industries where we have them. And the idea is by the end of that 12 weeks, they've gone through this really intensive process, they've done loads of testing, they've you know, got their prototype out there in the field. Um, some of them are later stage, they've, you know, they might have already had paid customers, um, but they've essentially, gather the evidence that they need to move their business onto the next stage, whether that's helping them gain investment, helping them like get the next pilot, helping them get the sort of the first paid customer. Um, and we finish with a big demo day event, which is we've got a cohort just wrapping up at the moment and their big demo day is tomorrow night. So it's quite an exciting time at BGB um, at the moment. Um, uh, and then once they come out of the accelerator program, so it doesn't finish at the, the end of the 12 weeks, so the kind of the networks that they might make once on the program are like really important. So um, the mentoring continues, um, the support that they get from the actual startup community themselves is really important. Um, uh, I think you'll hear the terms of like peer-to-peer -peer support and that sort of thing. Um, that continues, we've got an alumni network, we do alumni events. Um, and we are also able to offer um, follow-on funding to those ventures, which at the moment is up to 50K, and that's to help them sort of bridge them to the next stage of investment. Um, but I hope that gives you kind of a feel for at least what we do, um, and, and there are similar programs like ours out there, um, sort of uh, not only in London, but uh, I think I know Dot Forge at least sort of um, up here in North that does do stuff um, around social tech as well. Um, you, you probably you might know others yourself. Uh, but yeah, I'm kind of happy to talk more about that tonight. Okay, thank you. And we'll have a, an initial plan. <laughs> <laughs> that was only because I needed to change slides. Nice, well um, right. covered. <laughs> uh, so, uh, because I uh, have the podium, I can say I can choose what to ask first. So I wanted to start with a discussion really about causes. So. Um, <coughs> We notice work because I work at Reason Digital as well, and, and we've noticed working in the sector that people there are trends, and this is awfully crass, but there are trends within causes. So, for example, homelessness was really popular a while back, um, and then refugees had a bit of a thing that died down. The refugee crisis has not stopped, but people have stopped being interested in it. Um, and then, you know, there, there are other things that will kind of pop up and down. Do you have any thoughts on whether what? Uh, particular causes will get funded and whether there's a next big cause uh, that people are interested in. I know you mentioned democracy, so that kind of yeah, led into it. I mean, one of the things I would say is I think we are still waiting for the big breakthrough in how we show that tech leads to a better world, um, from charities, to be honest. You know, when you look at things like Uber, uh, Airbnb, Expedia, Amazon, all those things, they're private sector. We haven't really got anything that's come through the charitable sector that is comparable. Um, 
if you look at the big breakthroughs that have come through on the charitable sector and tech, they are fundraising. And you think of, first of all, SMS fundraising, text fundraising. And the other one is just giving. And just giving is not a charity. It's a, a, a private company that has developed a way of fundraising that has changed the, changed the scope of things. So I think in terms of, I think causes, I don't know, there are, you're right, there are causes that come and go. Um, I'd reiterate what Kieran said, some great stuff there, and actually, if I'll, all things I'd want to say. But one thing is, I think fundraising is really easy, actually. It's you find out what the funder wants to hear, you tell the funder what they want to hear. It is as simple as that. So whatever field you're working in, you need to find the right funder and find out. Uh, I mean, does anybody know what the mission statement of Comet Relief is? It's a just world free from poverty. Okay, so actually, when you you need to sort of when you're thinking of whatever your cause is, whatever you're working on, you need to look at the funders who are going to fund you. And it isn't just about going to a funder and saying, "I've got this fantastic idea," and the funder will fall over themselves and say, "That's amazing! I want to fund it." They will say, "Well, you know, funders are people," as Kieran said, and we have to report back and justify what we do. So we have to fund stuff that fits with what we fund. So I would say to you, causes will come and go. The key thing is whatever you're working on and you need funding, look at, try and search out for the right funder and build that relationship that Kieran talked about. You know, follow people on LinkedIn, follow them on Twitter, go to places where pe uh, people are, go and do presentations, uh, you know, phone up and see if you can speak to people. Um, but also, overall, I still think we're, the, 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 the chalice, if you like, that we're still hunting for is this big breakthrough that will be the thing that says wow tech has really changed people some sort of charitable tech for good has changed people's life I don't think we've got it yet can I make Ed reply to that I know I said I wouldn't do this I'm mm -hmm. sorry <laughs> uh, but only because what you're talking about really is like service delivery so yeah. we do a lot of fundraising stuff but really service delivery is going to be the big thing mm. um, I, I know we're working on a few things at the minute so I don't know if you want to talk about them um, I, I, I was just talking to, to, to Billy before we came on about things like AI and, and, and chatbots and I, th I think it's still early days uh, to see what they can do but, but we were talking about potentially how um, how you could automate uh, or automate triage for things uh, so for example like Childline can't answer every call uh, that they get at the moment which means that children go without speaking to people mm. and that maybe speaking to uh, a robot um, about basic things is better than speaking to nobody at all um, and those kind of things can apply to, to so many things people people with mental health issues that are isolated or, or, or depressed that, that there may be opportunities there um, so I, th I, th I think yeah there's potential in, in those kind of new technologies um, but but with what we've got now people are using social media people are using the internet in all kinds of ways that people didn't imagine that we would um, and there's a lot that can be done in, in, in peer support. There's a lot of stuff that can be done through Facebook and through Twitter that, that isn't banal and um, that isn't just an echo chamber of people's opinions. Um, and, and I think, yeah, there's the possibility that a breakthrough could happen through one of those yeah. places, you know, where, where we don't expect it to happen. Um, people sharing their lived experiences with other people, regardless of where they are in the world, uh, you know, um, the internet's got a great opportunity of of connecting people who are not physically close to each other but, but have lots of lots to give and lots to learn from each other. I'm going to disagree with what you said, so that's okay. Hi. Um, <laughs> because I totally hear what you're saying. In terms of media retention, there are really big themes, and clearly the, the kind of horrendous refugee um, crisis has happened um, over the last what, 12 to 18 months. Is, is a really big part of it and that gets a lot of media experience um sort of attention and for sure there are there are ways of kind of that's like a window of opportunity because again funders don't make programs in isolation they'll kind of get together and go right this is a massive problem right what can we do about it mm -hmm. however the reality is that funders work really slowly and it's so much effort to get a new funding program off the ground actually they tend to be quite far behind kind of like media trends i find um and secondly um actually i think a lot of funders are really good staying with core themes so if you talk about like poverty and poverty alleviation do you know what I mean that's been a consistent factor in the way that that we come with a sort of mission statement right and like if you look at other big funders out there like um Joseph Roundtree or, or whatnot you know those are really similar so I think that you end up in a situation which is the last thing I want to say which is you get as well you know right <laughs> yeah as probably who works in a charity in here 
who works in like a um, like a sort of startup y type environment where you have a startup thing that you want to start? Who's here just for pizza? <laughs> <laughs> um, <yeah. laughs> um, like you end up in a situation where you think, oh cool, I've got a thing, it's about like X social issue or whatever, and then like you manage to get some funding because it's kind of cool and it's off the ground and everyone's interested in it, and then you end up like cycling through that piece and you're like, what do I do now? Do you know what I mean? Where do I go next? And people end up dressing their their programs in lots of different clothes to appeal to fit funders and that's super dangerous yeah. Yeah. and it's like a really horrible catch-22 because you need more funding to continue but also your program gets so horrendously twisted like by all these different like funding requirements that you end up with not really what it is in the first instance which is why I think that the ability when you're applying to funding as Billy was saying to consistently articulate how your um, program project venture whatever addresses a systemic social issue such as poverty a lot can fit into that yeah so i think that's probably the skill that you need when you're fundraising is to be able to balance that you've still got a strong theory of change internal process but you can also articulate it in a way that funders sort of understand i think that's probably the real skill behind it um, and so this is not a cop out i think another big issue is going to be mental health i think that's going to consistently become very strong mm. now that's really good to hear because I, I, I hate the way that the general public ha finds causes trendy so it's good to hear that funders are really like grounded and have these kind of solid core causes that they work on, um, rather than getting tied up in the trends. So, so mostly, yes, <laughs> mostly, good ones too. Mostly. Good ones too. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, another thing I wanted to kind of ask was that I, I recently went to a tech good conference in in Brussels, and somebody, somebody from the European Union was there. Um, he was on first. Well, it was just after Brexit as well, so he was like, well, there, were, there was a funny joke about the translators, so there's translators, and he was like, we won't need these next week, because no. that was really awkward. Um, but he he basically just had a 10-minute rant about Tech for Good. He said all the negative things that was happening in Tech for Good. Um, and uh, the main thing I picked up out of that that resonated with what we do is that there's a lot of cannibalisation, so there's a lot of people trying to do the same thing. Mm. I, don't, I wondered what your experience of that was. Is that real? Are you seeing that? Definitely, yeah. Um, I, I think I'd really like Billy to talk about the application focus process, pro, um, application process they put through for comic relief. But you'll be like, whatever application process, that's quite dull. This is super important, actually. What's going on with it? And because it's a real fundamental, a sort of systemic part of trying to change the way that this happens. <laughs> oh, well, what, what he was talking about is we're trying to do a new method of, um, as I say, the, the last tech good has been vi video application, primarily two minute video, one page infographic, um, and. Um, Hundred words, and basically we had 145 applications. We've selected a long list of 55, and the terms and conditions say we checked it with our legal people, and it says we can publish this. And we said to people openly, we are going to publish a long list of the, what we think are the best, and we are still intending to do that. And we will ask 20 to come uh, fill in a, a proper paper application, the, the traditional way funders work, and then we will fund 10. But the idea being that 55, actually, what I think actually it's really interesting. Charities are supposed to be about transparency and openness, as is tech. Actually, the whole tech good field is not that open and sophisticated and sherry and cuddly and working together cooperatively. It's quite secretive. And that's charities are a bit like that because we all need our funding and we guard our, our, our funding. We don't want somebody else to, 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 to go away with it. So what we're trying to do is put it in the open really for three reasons. A, that people can see what others are doing and work with them. Secondly, that people can see what good tech, good stuff there is and be inspired by it. And thirdly, we can only fund 10 projects and we hope other people will, will pick them up and fund them. Um, I, I think that there are, we are tech for good people. There is not a lot of tech for good actually in the charity sector, to be honest. And it's interesting that person said, oh, there's tech good, it's all, you know, blah, the latest flash thing and stuff. I was saying to Ed, I think, you know, why do we fund Tech for Good? Because it's about charities, not-for-profits, need to stay relevant in the future. And I think there's a problem in the charitable sector that we do see one-to-one, face-to-face -face as the gold standard. Everything apart from that is a bit second best, to be honest. And Tech is, oh my God, that's right at the bottom because that's no way face-to-face, one-to-one. -face, um, -one. But I think we... You know, actually, that is the world, the reality of people's lives now. And why would anybody, you know, would all these disenfranchised people that charity is supposed to be catering for, they're all using online banking, and they wouldn't, none of them would want to not use online banking or am, will not stop using Amazon or stop using Expedia. Um, so I think actually, for, for, for chari my challenge back to that person would be if charities are going to be staying relevant, they've got to endorse tech. And actually, most charities are still stuck on the one-to-one, face-to-face -to -face gold standard. Mm. Um, it's just thinking about it from, from our perspective. So um, 
we're in the lucky position of, um, because we run this regular, quite early stage support program, um, we support uh, 20 ventures a year. Um, we probably see 300 <gasps> to 400 um, applications through over the course of the year. Um, so we, we get exposed to lots of ideas. Um, and yes, you do see like some of the same ideas coming through each time. But also I think there's a whole lot of diversity of, of stuff out there. Um, which is really exciting um, and uh, I think what funders are looking for it's um, you, you will get some of the same things coming through but if an idea can show that they're tackling something in a particularly sort of innovative or um, different way or a better way then that's still you know really relevant and important if it's going to have a bigger impact um, one of the things I'm thinking of just I don't know if this was part of the, the kind of EU guys frustration is the, um, kind of the hype around tech for good um, and it, uh, like we, we've been part of like trying to create that we think actually creating excitement around tech for good is a, a positive way and getting a lot of people to start thinking about kind of applying technology to, to more impact, impactful sort of um, means uh, but at the same time kind of want to acknowledge that tech for good like in a, like in itself is not like the whizzy new thing like these there there are problems out there and tech is actually just the the kind of enabler um, and I don't know there's a kind of subtle difference between those those two things can I check something around the support so because it's a really interesting <laughs> question about the cannibalization and I think maybe like uh, there's two things here. So one of which is because you were just talking earlier about kind of uh, chatbot like triage system, which is really funny because that's what we did for Centerpoint. We worked with them on Fuse this year for like young people reaching out at a point of crisis. And I feel like there's something going on in the open source world where you build on other people, like modular reuse is a really good thing. Do you know what I mean? That's like an inherent like process that you do also because it's much cheaper to use like a library, you know, when you're building something clearly then write it all yourself. Like that is nuts. Why would you do that? And I feel like that kind of reuse thing is actually quite odds about how some of the way that we work in the sort of funding sort of space because people want like a new thing and they sort of want you to build it to scratch and that's a good thing. Whereas if you say you reuse something else, that's sort of seen as a as a negative. So I think that's a real issue. So again, if you're looking for funding, I'd be like, oh, we're making a new shiny thing. That's great. But then in practice, unless they're a good funder, talk like build it on something else. <coughs> and the second part of that links to this issue around um, the big thing that we're seeing in charities. I'd like to put forward the argument of something like Ushahidi. If you come across Ushahidi, I presume most people have. If you come across Ushahidi, put your hand up. Oh, right, okay, cool. Oh, wow, okay, right, good. In which case, Ushahidi is like a massive like platform, mapping platform. It came out of um, Kenya originally. It was there, sort of built very quickly to map um, the election violence um, during Kenyan election. It's gone on to be quite a big platform in which people use to kind of map things. It's been used for flooding, it's been used for elections, it's been used for uh, bribery, I think. It's been used for all manner of things. It's a really big platform. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the things which stop cannibalization, it's like quite interesting to think about not just the tech platforms, but also the operational platforms that can exist to support things. Does that sort of make sense? Yes. Okay, cool. I, Sorry. Uh, I, I, I was going to say, uh, on the other side of that, as, uh, as a, a, an entrepreneur looking for, for, for funding, uh, in, t in terms of the cannibalization thing, I, th I think that's just as relevant uh, and just as true of the tech sector generally as well. I mean, um, on Facebook and LinkedIn groups um, about startups and tech startups, people are saying, oh, I've got this idea, it's like Uber for this, or, or it's Deliveroo for everything. That really turns us off, by the way, yeah. don't do that. Because <laughs> even though it's, it's a very simple idea for you to be able to communicate, the, there already is a Deliveroo, so it, it's easy for Deliveroo <laughs> to be Deliveroo for everything, and it can kill your business like that. So I, th I think that there's too much of this thinking of Uber for something or Airbnb for something. Um, I'm, was it Peter Thiel's book, Zero, for, uh, Zero to One, where he talks about inventing something that isn't derivative of something else, that it is something brand new, and it becomes a success because there's nothing like it. Uh, and this is where you often get the black swans from the things like the PayPal's and you know the Facebooks and things like that, because um, he argues that um, big companies get ousted by by little ones who then become big. You know, nobody saw Facebook happening, so Facebook took over from from a lot of things that were happening. Same with Google. Uh, Google wasn't the biggest search engine at the time, but but now it's this massive thing. Apple came along, did a similar thing. But the problem now is that Apple, Google, Microsoft are all competing against each other to do the same things. They're doing search engines, they're doing online collaboration <coughs> tools, they're doing hardware increasingly. And what's going to happen is another underling business is going to come along and, and, and it's going to take over 
So, so Apple in the future will not be the massive beast it is now. Something else is going to come along. But what's going to come along is not an Apple for something else. It's going to be something totally new that nobody's ever heard of. That's what Airbnb is. That's what Uber was. You, you know, so it's it, it's not an Uber for something else. It's an Uber. You know, that that's what we need is, is more of those. How do you get them? I, anyone, I, I, anyone know? I, I genuinely think it's about um, it is about finding problems that, that, that are not being um, solved at the moment um, and if somebody would have said to you I know what we'll do we'll, we'll, we'll rent out our place like hotels but we'll, we'll invite complete strangers into our homes mm-hmm. that, that's, that's an insane idea it's, it's crazy who would, <laughs> who would do that so, so it's, it, it, it's thinking about things in a different way I think um, and, and yeah, if, if I knew how to do that, I'd, I'd be rich already. So. <laughs> I think it is about thinking about things in a new way, but one thing I would emphasise that Kieran said, it's really important to use what we've already got. You know, that Kieran did a Winston Churchill um, oh, yeah, yeah. trip round uh, Africa and, and, one, and did a really good report. One of the things he noted is that in Africa, a lot of the tech is based on the tech that people use every day, whereas in the developing country or in developed countries we sort of more think we've got to find the bright new shiny thing and actually it's the same thing Ed said you know social media is massive here people use social media all the time and it's really boring Facebook that we think is really dull or something like that but actually that is central to a lot of people's lives so in a lot of ways if we're going to find something that is going to change their life you have to work with the tech at their level rather than trying to create something that they're going to migrate to because mm-hmm. it's so wonderful so that's what I would say to you I think the bit I don't know yeah who knows what the big breakthrough is but really do look at the tech that the people you're targeting to you know make their lives better look at the tech they're using the tech they feel comfortable with and work with them on that level rather than creating something that you think they're going to magically migrate to because that doesn't really happen yeah n- nobody needs a linkedin for accountants accountants have already got linkedin <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i'm gonna ask well, i've got quite a few more questions but i'll ask one more before i open it up to the floor so have a think <laughs> um the, this is just a personal thing i'm really curious um have you seen more applications over time i feel like tech for good is trendy now it's becoming bigger is it growing I can, I can speak from an NT perspective, not a trust. So like, so like, I was working on my trust like maybe four years, four, four, maybe four. Oh, okay. It was a while ago. Like when there was quite a small sector, to be honest with you. And what you were seeing was like pretty sort of similar basic stuff coming through. And then over the years, as it got more and more popular, you got much more interesting stuff, like bigger diversity of stuff, like more inclusive stuff in different areas. And I think that's like super, super important. So I totally think it's getting more diverse and more open, which is like can only be a positive thing, you know. And um, I guess my one thing to kind of wrinkle on that is like. Like I'm not really sure what tech for good is. Like I've I've got a blog post that is in my head that I haven't published yet, which is kind of around this thing, which is which I can go into, but it'll bore you silly, so I won't. Um, but like anyway, I'm just like that's a thing. Like where's the line, right, between like health tech and tech for good? Yeah, do you know what I'm saying? Like yeah, between civic massive. tech and day, like what's going on? I think that's a thing that we're going to have to face at some point. Like yeah, um, yeah, we probably just thinking through the numbers. Um, our applications probably increase thirty percent, thirty to forty percent each time. Um, and also, I helped to run a, a meetup which Karen's also involved in um, in London called the Tech for Good sort of meetup, and we've now got I think it's over five thousand people. Um, uh, it's a, a huge community, and like we're pretty lazy in promoting it, and it just seems to be kind of um, yeah exploding. And I think that's around yeah this appetite of, of doing something with a bit more impact. Okay, questions. Go ahead. You go ahead. Go first. Hi. Uh, do you think funders need to start looking at different structural models of organisations so they're more representative of users, so you have like multi-stakeholder cooperatives and platform cooperatives that are designed and also owned by the people who use the service? Is there a, is there a, is there a lack of, of that happening? I would say yes. I think that's one of the major issues. So, like, very briefly, one of the big, the biggest things that we did at Nominate Trust was to move to funding for-profit organisations. That was really hard for a corporate foundation. That was really, really tough. So, I would say is to pick up the kind of the Billy's point. Like, funders are operating in a space and a sphere, and they have accountabilities and they have pressures depending on where they get their money. Some of it's like maybe sort of public facing pressure, others is corporate pressure. So I think yeah, but like they don't exist in a vacuum. Do you know what I mean? So I think it's like how do you support them to change? Like that you have like you, they don't they really. Sometimes don't have that much agency, really. Yeah, they, they have their own responsibilities. So I think yes, but it's it's a challenge. 
I, I mean, we, we would, Comic Relief is, we'll fund not for profits and we will fund co ops. We don't get applications from co ops. You know, it's just they don't come in. Um, I mean, our bigger issue is we've just said we, we really want to fund um, charities because uh, there's been a big drive in the last 20 years around civic policy to say everybody become a social enterprise. Charities are really old fashioned and boring and dull. Become a social enterprise and social <laughs> enterprises. You know, there is no one existing form of a social enterprise. I mean, we've entered this thing now where, God, you know, we, we, what we define as social enterprise is so many different forms, um, you know, right up to CICs limited by shares, so long as that's okay, so long as they've got a, 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 a social mission in their, their, their constitution and a, a, an asset lock. Um, but no, I, 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 to be honest, I don't, I, I would love more co ops to apply, I would love more. I'm really happy when social enterprises apply, when they're real social enterprises and they're not like one person really who should be a sole trader and has, but has sort of branched themselves as a social enterprise to, to get grants. Um, but I'm also really keen to not denigrate charities that actually charities have done bloody brilliantly over the last 200 years, you know, like charities like the Red Cross, Bernardo's, NSPCC, RSPCA, they've been like stalwarts of society and I think there's a danger that we sort of belittle them and said that oh, that's really old school we don't need to do that anymore I think there's still a role for them I think char charities can be very innovative as well I mean yeah. uh, uh, take charities like Charity Water there's no reason for them to exist there's plenty of other water charities that, that do sanitation and clean water but the way that they do it um, is, co is completely innovative and, and they get a lot of support and as a result of that uh, so I, th I think that you know there are a lot of innovations going on in the charity sector as well um, to, yeah, to not write them off completely as well. Yeah. My, my impression has been that in the kind of the grant funding space and the kind of social enterprise sphere that it, it has been quite open to kicks and co-ops, mm. maybe you've found otherwise, but, um, and that comes from um, our own startups where quite often grants have been quite important in, in the early stage. They've actually not been able to access a lot of grant funding because they're a company limited by shares, mm, they're yeah. for profit, and they've had feedback that you know if they had a more cooperative model, if they had an asset lock, um, then they would apply. But because they don't have that, they're, they're excluded. Um, our, for BGV ourselves, um, so we we only fund um, yeah company limited by shares, um, and that is because we found for like very early stage ideas, just having a simple company structure has been like the best way to get going because you can if you find out that the best way for you to scale or have a bigger impact down the line is to have a different model, so maybe a co-op or to be a charity, it's kind of it's easier to change into that. Um, than it is to start out as a as a charity or a kick and, and trying to go out of it. Um, uh, um, I guess like in terms of like why we invest in the structures that we do. Um, uh, one thing you should think about like sort of with all funders is like risk and reward. So different types of funders will have different appetites for risk and they will expect different types of reward for that. And this applies to the impact space um, as well. So. Um, in terms of normal, um, sort of more strain, mainstream funders, so maybe it's sort of like angel investors, institutional investors, VC funds, banks, um, they will have sort of, um, they will invest, uh, take on different risk, which means like, I guess, invest at different stages. And uh, generally, if they operate at an earlier stage, they expect a higher reward. And that the way they're going to get that higher reward is um, by having a stake in your business. And so they're looking at things that are going to grow. They're looking for huge scale um, and sort of taking lots of little bits and hoping that like the Facebook or whatever, the Google comes along and they'll make their money. In the impact space, it's still helpful to think about risk and reward. Um, some impact funders will expect a kind of financial reward alongside the impact sort of reward, whereas other, other funders might just expect kind of certain impact outcomes, and, but it's still kind of helpful to think about that, that in terms of yeah, risk and reward. So we um, are in the, that kind of earlier stage thing, so we're taking lots of little bets. Um, and our model is that we hope that we might see the first really big tech for good um, uh, venture at scale. Um, and we uh, ourselves are set up so that we will reinvest that returns into um, running BGB and investing in more startups, so a kind of like evergreen model. It is one of the things that, that we've encountered, though, in, in looking for funding, is that, yeah, that there'll be a whole section of, of funding that isn't available to us because it's only charities that comply. 
or it's only a particular kind of, uh, of social enterprise that has an asset lock that can apply, so we're excluded from that as well. Um, but one of the, way, the ways that, that we find the found to negotiate that is, is to work in partnership with other organisations, and this is something that, that Billy mentioned earlier about finding the right kind of partner to work with. Um, so I, I think the value of working with partners is that we can work with a charity, for example, and be a tech partner for them. So they have the knowledge of, of, of the issues, the sector, they have the networks, they have the theory of change, that, uh, but, they don't, but they lack the technological knowledge perhaps to get a piece of tech, tech for good work done. So we can partner with them uh, and it means that they can apply to the funder because they're a charity and get the funding, but they come to us to do, to do the technical work and we work in partnership with them on that. So and th there's lots of different vehicles like joint ventures and uh, you know all, all kinds of things that can be done so that that, that, that people can work together in different organisations to, to apply for, for the right kind of funding uh, for, for the project that works for them. Yes, um, I had a question for Jess. Um, that was about um, what's the background to Bethel Green Ventures? Is it? It's not a charity itself, obviously. So we're. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the back, I'll try and do it quickly. Um, so it's quite interesting, so it was um, set up as an initiative back in 2008. Um, a, a group of people um, ran a series of like hack days called Social Innovation Camp, so bringing together um, developers along with um, people from charity backgrounds or people with knowledges of different social problems. Um, uh, came together, um, worked on these gnarly problems, created loads of cool ideas and then went away back to their day jobs because there was no further support. Um, and so it was at that time the kind of the tech scene um, in London was kind of in its nascent stages. We were starting to see the first kind of um, early stage VC accelerator type models. Um, and this is before I joined BGB, but the, the team at the time were then quite interested in, um, okay, can we apply that kind of early stage tech support um, to social outcomes? And they piloted um, the first version of the accelerator program, I think back in 2011. Um, with no funding attached, just literally kind of having this competitive selection process, having a cohort of people, like a defined program, attaching them to mentors, and even with no funding attached, by the end of that 12-week period, they found that those ideas have all advanced, and um, one of those um, ideas was Good Gym, which is now, um, they're, they're a charity that they connect runners with kind of isolated older people in the community, and they've branched out across several cities um, in the UK. Um, but basically, on the, the back of the pilot, um, we then secured funding from um, the government, from the Cabinet Office, Social Incubator Fund, um, from Nesta and from Nominet Trust, um, and that has funded us over the past four years to, to run our accelerator program. And, and they're, they're for their funders, or like for the Cabinet Office, they were interested in creating um, like this pipeline of early stage ideas to kind of support the infrastructure that they've been building around later stage impact investing. Um, Karen might be able to talk a bit more about the motivations of Nominate Trust, but uh, it's still uh, similar to like Nesta is around creating this this like very early stage yeah, pipeline of ideas. Um, and we're now, like I just said, it was to fund us for four years, we've come to the end of that, so we've been fundraising ourselves. So BGV is a bit like a startup, like I know what it's like to be in a startup and to come, like kind of live with insecurity and come to the end of your funding and have to be pitching for more. Um, but we have secured funding from Big Society Capital, so again, kind of public funding to help kind of boost the infrastructure for social impact investing. Um, and we are matching funding that with a couple of other partners, and we're kind of going to be announcing that in the next few weeks. I hope that's it's quite exciting, and that's going to enable us to grow what we're doing. So we're changing our support slightly next year. We're doing a lot more for our alumni teams because now we've got this community of um, startups that are sort of two, three years old, facing like quite exciting, like hiring, growth, scaling challenges, and we want to be able to support them, both financially, but also with ongoing mentorship. Um, so, yeah, it's, quite, it's a good time for, for us. Anyway. Any questions from Periscope? Wave to Periscope. No, no questions. <laughs> How about Facebook? Wave to Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> no, okay, anyone? Yeah? yeah. I got a question about uh, these, uh, the selection process for programs. Mm -hmm. um, I am as a basically sole uh, business person who started my business and uh, I have a business background. I am a developer, PHP developer and uh, I 
I'm, I'm really keen to know about what kind of criteria, what kind of a personality you, you're looking for in your like a co-founders. Because I always found, like if I know if I apply for any fund, as well, I have to go and out, go out and look for a co-founder because that's what they want. They want a team, which I understand that. In terms of scale of the business, things like you, you need the team to you know make that business go global or even national size. But is it like a time? It, the time cons no, I'm not saying time consuming, but is, is it is, is it is needed require time and you know re require resources? For example, I, I this is my I start I wake I woke up five o'clock in the morning. I'm still up. I'm gonna come back to Sheffield at ten o'clock at night. But I'm, I, I'm really struggling to find that time to go and look for people. I cannot talk to my colleagues, which I do, I mean, in my day-to-day -day job. I, I don't want to basically involve them in my venture. But I have to go and find th those kind of minds, the same minds of people in, in these kind of events. What type of criteria you're looking for? What type of people you're looking for at that uh, team? Yeah. Um. Just to attempt to kind of paraphrase that, um, so you're talking about, and we, we see this with lots of people um, that we meet and they apply, um, they're working on an idea but at the moment they've been doing it by themselves and in order to get to the next stage, you know, they kind of need people to work with. And uh, lots of um, funders, uh, accelerator programs, more like in the kind of startup space, will fund um, only teams, not sole founders. And I've mentioned before that we tend to work with, with mostly teams um, just because they can cope more with, with the kind of rapid um, growth that we expect out of the startups. I think the question is really sort of not criteria would we have on co-founders, but almost like what criteria should you have in kind of choosing a co-founder? Mm -hmm. And what I would say is that it's, it's kind of easier to get divorced than it is to kind of break up out of a, a, a startup, break up with your co-founder. So I strongly, strongly urge you like not to rush into bringing co-founder on board just to kind of match a funding criteria because the most common breakup of um, or reason why startups fail, and we do see lots of failure, we expect lots of failure, and we embrace that, is because of team issues. Um, so I think it's really, really important that you find kind of think about the skill set within your team and make sure that you're bringing on um, someone that has complementary skill set. Because if you have a bunch of people like all with the same skill sets and with a big gap in another area, that's going to clash down the line. Um, and also think about people that are really bought into the, probably most importantly, bought into the underlying like mission of what it is you're trying to do. That's what I I'll say on that. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. Um, I I started this business with with a partner, um, and I think it's really important to to find the right kind of partner um, because he fills uh, the the gaps that I have in my skills. Um, and vice versa, the, the, there's some things that he's very good at, and there's also some things that he's very bad at, and I'm hoping that I, I do those quite well. Um, so I, I'd, I'd say to, that you have to kind of trust somebody, uh, that you have to know somebody, so start with the people that you know and the people around you. Do, do they actually have skills that, that you're not aware of? Um, they might already be bought into you as a person and bought into to, to the idea of your business. So I'd say start with who you know, rather than going into places where you know that, that, that founders hang out. Um, and then just try exhausting those possibilities first. Because uh, eight years later, we're still working together and we've got 40 staff now and you know I like to think it's going quite well. <laughs> where do founders hang out? Sorry. Um, so, fa like Facebook cool groups, <laughs> uh, <laughs> cafes in the Northern Quarter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Events like this. Any other questions? I'll take one more, so you'll be the last one. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so with the way um, the web is kind of progressing now, the barrier to entry is becoming so high because you need like a front end developer, a back end developer, designers, UX, and the like. So to use your example of funding, twenty grand, if you're lucky, you could blow that funding in in, in your first month or two of paying for the senior people. Um, on your project so how would you recommend bringing people on board who are maybe not as financially driven mm -hmm. or have that kind of senior level of experience you need yeah that's really challenging and it's quite interesting to hear you put it like that because we've been talking about how 
the barriers to entry have never been so low for like <laughs> getting you know being able to get a tech idea off the ground um, I don't have the perfect answer for you so we acknowledge that our funding is um, very small and 20k doesn't get you very far um, and it's also part of the reason why we kind of um, uh, encourage there to be the technical person within the founding team um, it means that you don't have to go and hire like a whole tech dev team or, or outsource your tech to, in order to, to prototype. Um, in terms of the kind of stage where we are funding ideas, a lot of the time it is like very early MVP stuff, so you don't need a whole like whiz bang solution. And actually, um, we'd encourage you just to kind of hand crank stuff in the kind of pilot phase. Um, you might have like a nice kind of smoke and mirrors, um, like WordPress thing in front, back behind it. You're using Google Sheets to actually do matching or run the service yourself, and that will that, that will get you like you might be able to. The things you're trying to do is test your assumptions, um, like gather some data points around that, so you can show that you've got a validated proposition and that there's an appetite for this. So there's like momentum, and I think you can do that without without having you know like the full tech team. And I'd say as well, don't, don't let things like that put you off applying for incubators and, and accelerators because uh, you'll meet some very well-connected people um, that, that can hook you up with, with funders, with, with um, technical people that they worked with before, uh, with investors. Um, I, I've known people who've managed to sell their businesses when they were just ideas on napkins. Um, and they, they didn't need techies in order to do that, but that's because they had the background, that's because they, they had um, people that were committed to the ideas that they were suggesting, and they had the networks, so they were able to go to people and say, I've got this idea, this is what I'll do, this is my background, um, and this is what I want to do, and, and people do get funded. So, yeah, don't, don't not go on an accelerator or an incubator because you think, actually, I need more money than that. I just had two things to so say. Obviously, totally agree with everything. The other thing is, I reckon like barriers are like much lower, like in terms of learning how to do stuff yourself as well. And big like, so like sort of taught myself to code and stuff because it was a really important part of not being able to find it. But just one thing on hiring developers. I said this to someone about eight hours ago. Hired a couple of developers. Yes, um, which is good. And that's the um, I made a really big mistake, which is that I thought if I went and talked to people in specific fields like development, they'd be really interested in doing something, which was kind of a good thing. Uh, like in the world and I led with that which was stupid because that's not true not that they're not interested in that but actually if you're a really skilled person and you're really interested in skills you're interested in making your skills better so you're interested in like really chunky problems yeah you're interested in like really thorny stuff that's what like you know like gets you interested yeah so that angle has been evidently a lot more sort of profitable do you know what I mean it's about like it's about putting out really interesting challenges for people that really speak to their own skills development I think that's my lesson like really personally from recruiting those type of people Okay, thank you for your questions. Anybody who's been before will know that I found that very hard. I don't like Q&As, and that was an entire Q&A. Um, I also let it run over, so check me out being chill. Um, I'm going to round up with two more questions, and I'm going to tell you what they are, so you've got a chance to think about it in advance. Um, I'm going to ask you what, who your favourite project that you've worked with or funded is. Maybe not. Maybe you can pick your favourite funded that got funded. Favorite project that got funded. And one top tip. I know you've already given five, you've got to pick one. So one final tip and we'll start with favorite projects does anyone have one and want to start shall i like do a proper loving and do that so all the work around um with safety nets uh you don't have to do that it's no okay. but i'm going to tell you about why i think it's really like because i thought about this because i was working at nt when nominate trust when that um kind of came got supported and um the reason i think it's uh, such an important piece safety sorry safety nets the sex worker uh, the sex worker app that i mentioned earlier on Sorry. Um, so the reason I think that that was really important is that one of which is it took an existing model that was operating in a kind of commercial space, which was this idea of kind of proximity notification to notify someone in your local area. That was a really big thing of things like dating apps and stuff, yeah, which is a really existing workable model. But then it took that and applied it to uh, a, like a community and society, which is like massively under focused on, do you know what I mean? Massively unsupported and massively, um, I think, uh, I'm under understood if I'm honest with you and I think that that is a really rare thing because it comes back to your kind of sexy issue thing at the beginning do you know what I mean that's something which wasn't it's really addressed it's not a sexy issue no totally right? weirdly so, oh god yeah I'm <laughs> awful yeah like, bad pun so, but like those those two things for me existing strong like model of interaction on top of a particular community that's why I think it's such an important thing favourite project um, 
So obviously we love all our projects the same. Um, <laughs> uh, um, going back to like one of the, the startups from our very first cohort, so I don't know if any people have ever heard of Fairpo. Um, yeah. It came out of an idea from the Varg Society, a kind of think tank, um, where they wanted to encourage more sustainable um, hardware and more sustainable kind of cell phones, computers, just production of, of hardware in general. Um, and, you know, after kind of trying to lobby the likes of, of Apple or, you know, the big producers, they were just not getting anywhere. And so they were like, okay, like, because these Apple's like, you know, it's impossible, we can't do it. Um, like, the only way we're going to be able to, like, influence this change um, is to kind of show them that it can be do done. Like, we, we're going to have to make these products ourselves. Um, and so they came up with the idea of focusing on the smartphone to begin with because it's a product that so many people have. Um, and it was literally just at that idea stage that they came onto the very first BGV. So um, uh, Miguel and Bears, they flew over to London. Um, BGVT at the time even helped them to like rent a room in the flat. I think there was kind of a BGV house where there were like several teams all renting together. They even had to like share a bed because they were sort of like being really frugal. And, and it was definitely like one of the crazier ideas at the time. Like, I think um, if you go back and talk to the BGB team that are involved in selection, they're like, this is bonkers, but these guys are really kind of passionate and let's just give it a go. Um, and it's now our biggest startup. So um, they have sort of uh, 80 or so people in their team based in Amsterdam. They produced two smartphones. So the first smartphone came out, I think, a couple of years ago. And, and in this year, the um, Fairphone 2 came out. And it, it's been like such a mammoth task. So I d like they've gone right back to mines in the Congo to find um, uh, mines that uh, you know don't come from like conflict areas. They've had to go to China and source um, factories that have more um, sort of worker-friendly approaches. They've looked at the whole supply chain route, and it's not perfect. It's still not a completely like ethically um, sort of fair phone, but they're they're making progress and. Um, they they pre-sold their first Fairphone, I think it was like 60,000 phones that went. Um, you can still buy the Fairphone 2, and I've got one if anyone wants to have a play with it. <laughs> oh, have you? I, yeah. I absolutely love Fairphone. I'm like obsessed they're with Fairphone. Really cool. I talk about it all the time. I did not know that came from you yeah, guys. Yes, the other thing they're trying to do is not only to kind of, <laughs> it's super ambitious, not only change the way that these things are being made, but also to change our consumer behavior so that we don't want a new phone every time it comes out. It's made to, to last. So you can, it's the first. Do you want, a, do you want a new phone? Sorry? Do you want a new phone yet? Oh, no, 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 I love it. No, that. okay, good. <laughs> um, it's the, I was having a bit of a whinge before because a bit on Android broke. Is it um, work phone or personal sorry? phone? Is it work phone or personal phone? <laughs> it's got two SIMs in it, so it's, it's oh, both. Okay. But um, it's the first in the world fully modular phone, so you can pull it apart. Like, if the screen breaks, you pull it apart, they send you a new screen, you put it back together. They've got a new camera coming out soon. What they'll do is you can just buy it, pop the old camera in, put the... Um, put the yeah, old camera out, put the new camera in. You get my kind of gif. But um, yeah, that, that's my favorite one. I think because it's like I can show people and then they really get what I mean. I'm like, this is tech for good. It's done really well as well. They've come yeah. up now, use it, uh, yeah. selling it. And, and they raised sort of five million plus this year to be able to kind of scale what they're doing. So it's cool, cool. Um, it's not one we funded, but it's one Jess mentioned. Good gym. I think it's a, a, a brilliantly simple idea. You know, you take running and exercise and volunteering, and the thing that glues it all together is the internet. Uh, and actually, it's you know, and it's really getting critical mass. There's a thing. Tech can be ahead of its time, and I've funded ideas, and I think they probably need to, two years down the line. They might work. They're probably not going to work now. But I think it's of its time. It's getting critical mass. It got a massive sponsorship from New yeah. Balance, I think. Yeah. It's a bit dodgy now with Trump and stuff, but never mind. Um, but I think, you know, I think that's a great example of something very simple that works, and it works because technology made it work. That it, it couldn't have worked a couple of years, well, for 10 years ago, because technology wasn't there to do it, and the technology simply brings together two very simple things. Uh, tip, I think there's something coming through in terms of the bit I fund of charities and digital developers working charities and stuff that one of the things that's coming back to us from externally from our tech experts we work with they're saying you got your guys you work with they don't worry about monetizing stuff and it's really interesting when you do something in the commercial world you won't do something tech wise unless it's going to make shitloads of money um, but 
we go to the opposite extreme in tech for good sometimes. We just do things because they're fantastic things to do and they're going to change the world and make wonderful things. And we don't worry about how do you make money out of this. And actually, the money bit is important not to make masses of money, but simply to be able to wash your face and keep it updated and stuff um, and keep it relevant. I funded apps, 20,000 downloads. They were free of charge. Nobody's ever used them. They can use them because they've never been updated. You know, there are digital tools, 50,000 users. They haven't been updated for three years because they're free of charge. So my challenge to you guys would be, I think, think about you know, it's monetized. How can you make this, the stuff you're doing, how does it bring in money, not on a massive scale, but enough to keep it updated and modern and relevant? Um, and and that, is the, that is, I think, one of the key challenges. We've, we've got past the stage of just saying, oh, let's do amazing things with tech for social good and, oh, sob, sob worrying about if it makes money. We've actually got to be a bit more mature now about it, I think. Top tip, Ed? Um, it, it's all about the people. Um, so make sure that you have the right partnerships, that you're working with the right organisations, uh, that you find the right funders, that you have good relationships with them, um, that, that you employ the right people, that you go into partnership with the right kind of people. It, it's all about the people at the end of the day, um, throughout the whole chain, from, from, from the beneficiaries and, and the people that make use of the tech as well. That, that, that's it from me. Okay, Kieran? Um, test everything. Like, but boy, he thinks probably wrong because it always is like all of us stuff. So yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to change my tip every time we we go along. <laughs> it was going to be like think about how um, to bring in revenues that like, just like uh, alongside investment. Like oh, we probably have too many startups that like uh, focusing so much investment when they should just be thinking about how they can get some income. And it was going to be we talked a lot about sort of like really really understanding um, what funders want. Like that is so critical. Um, so I'm not going to just mention those again, but like, I guess a real practical tip. Um, so uh, quite often funders won't fund you first time, um, mm. and that's totally totally fine. <laughs> uh, well, obviously, probably not fine for you at that time. But I mean, like, what I mean is they might fund you the next time or the time after. So we we definitely had people come um, apply. They haven't been quite ready, um, or there's been certain things sort of missing. The timing hasn't been quite right we will try and provide really constructive feedback and we invite people to come back and apply and we have had teams that have come back sort of a second or time and they've come onto the programme. Um, and in terms of like, I guess thinking about uh, startup investment like angel investors and that kind of thing, they will want to build a relationship with you. Like they can't kind of invest on a single information point, a single meeting, because they, they're trying to assess whether, um, they're trying to assess your team potential, they're trying to understand the importance of the idea, what you're doing, they're trying to understand whether you've got this scale, like potential traction, you will have heard, it's probably the traction word bandied about a, a lot, but they can't get that understanding of traction, like, like I say, from that one, one meeting. So um, I would say if you kind of, if you meet a funder, if you think that like you're aligned with sort of what what they're trying to achieve is what you're trying to achieve, um, but it's not quite right at that point in time, like ask them like, oh, would you like to be um, kept up to date on our progress, um, or uh, kind of think about a way that they can help you, like oh, we're we're really looking at the moment for connections to X, like is there anyone in your network, um, and that's. That's really helpful because fun, like investors do want to come in and help, and if there's like a qu quite practical ask, that's a really nice way of them coming in, getting involved, getting to know you a bit. And then if they do say like yes, we'd be happy to kind of keep updated, um, like make a note like once a month, like have a calendar thing, like um, uh, have a little investor email that goes out, um, and almost treat it a bit like your sales pipeline. This is a relationship that needs to be nourished, and it can just be like a small small thing being like, uh, like hey, um, just keeping you updated on, on how things will be going this month. Um, uh, sort of like have one sentence on like the main thing you've been focusing on, then maybe a couple of bullet points on some like updated stats. Oh, like the pilot with so-and-so is going great. We've got sort of X number of users using it. We hit a bit of a tricky point in that, I don't know, this fail, but this is what we learned from it and then sign up with like, and, and this is the kind of help that we're looking for next, and sort of like, that's it. But a kind of like a regular monthly update like that just keeps you kind of front in mind, like keeps your name kind of popping up in the inbox, and it means that when, when the time is right and there is a match, like um, it just, it really helps everything sort of move along. 
Okay, thank you very Thanks, much. Um, Billy, Ed, Kieran, Jeff. Yes.